All right, let's go to Proverbs 6 this morning, please. Proverbs 6. We're going to go to verse 16. The Bible says, These six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning, Lord, and thank you for this chance for us to come together to learn more about you, Lord, and your word. And Father, I just ask that you fill us with the Holy Ghost to be able to illuminate us with regards to the seven deadly sins. And Father, we give you thanks and praise for all things, especially for that salvation that saved us from these sins that was given through your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And this morning, I'd like to introduce a new topic for Sunday School, which is going to be the famous seven deadly sins. Whoa. And we all know that these became famous due to Roman Catholic doctrine over the years and all this. But we're going to look at these biblically because there's actually a lot that can be drawn out from the scriptures about these sins, about how they affect us, and the reality that God can give us the victory from each one. Okay. But before we even start that, we need to know what sin is. Okay. So this series will also be a series on the big word, harmatology, or whatever you want to call it, okay? doctrine of sin. Um, but it is important to figure out what sin is. So let's go to 1 John 3. Let's just take a look here. 1 John 3. If we don't know what sin is, how can we even do this lesson or this series in general? 1 John 3. In verse 4, we have one definition of sin here from the Apostle John. And he says, Whosoever committeth, notice here are things that you do, commit, committeth sin, transgresseth also the law. For sin, in this case that which you commit, is the transgression of the law. And we see that there are sins of commission, sins that you actually practice and do with action, that manifest in your walk of life, that you commit in part with your body, you actually physically do them. Okay. But then there's the other side of the spectrum, and I forgot to remove a verse here, but go to Romans 14, we'll skip Hebrews 8. Romans 14. And I have Hebrews 8 there because it talks about God being merciful to people's unrighteousness, so it gives you an idea of where this other version of sin plays, but it actually makes more sense in Spanish. So Romans 14 and verse 23, we'll see something direct about sin here. That's different. The Bible says, And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So first we saw that sin was a transgression of the law, and it had to do with something you committed. Now we're seeing that there's a sin that has to do with doubt, something internal, something spiritual from within. And if you lack faith in doing that for some reason, that's sin. That kind of makes you think. Another verse on that idea, James 4, James chapter 4. James chapter 4. In verse 17, the Bible also says famously, Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. And just to put these things together here, okay, when you know to do something that's good and you don't do it, that's unrighteousness, because doing good would be something righteous. But it can be tied to something that's internal, something that's inside that you doubt, or lack to manifest, lack to do. Okay? And so you can look at this as a list of sins of omission. Things you fail to do that you should. Okay. And so sin seems to be things that you do that are against God's law and things that you fail to do that are also in God's law. So sin in general is just something that's not in accordance with the law of God, not in accordance with His nature, not in accordance with Him. Okay, you see? Oh, we're getting a here this morning. 
Let's see. Is that my phone? Oh. Nope, that is not. Yeah. And what we're going to notice as we look at these seven deadly sins this morning is that, I'll take a look there, is that basically these sins qualify into one of these two general groups of sin. Either they involve things you commit in your flesh or things that you fail to do in your spirit and your soul. Okay. And during this series what we're going to do is, is build up. We're going to progress towards all seven, starting with the most fundamental and working our way up. Okay. First thing you need to consider when it comes to types of sin is iniquity. And notice the word in and iniquity. We all know the verse in Psalm 66, verse 18. Okay. Uh, Psalm 66 and verse 18. It's been cited many times by preachers. But it is important. The Bible says, If I regard iniquity, notice where it is, in my heart, so it's within you, the Lord will not hear me. The Lord will not hear me. I'm wondering if it's tied to something I got on here. God will choose not to hear you because you have this spiritual iniquity hiding and residing in your heart. And that's why it's iniquity. It's within you. And that's really where all sin begins. Okay? There's two primary types of uh, deadly sin here that fit in this category or this type. The first being pride. Pride. What is that? Okay? Well, notice eyes in the middle of pride, just like eyes in the middle of sin. Okay. And the idea is that you focus on yourself more than God. You focus on what you want more than what God wants for your life. And you can look at this as the root of all other sins in general. Okay. The author of sin, his first sin was pride. Okay. He lifted himself up and thought he could actually just be equal with God. Which we can't even do that. Okay. And that feeds into the idea of lust, lust, where you follow desires that are contrary to those that God has given to you and in his word. Okay. So because you want to focus on yourself, you're going to choose to do those things that you want to do, and they may not be in accordance with what God wants in your life. And because you're regarding that kind of iniquity in your heart, the Lord will choose not to hear you. Be like that. You're not being humble, you see. Um, and then the second type of sin is just sin in general. Okay. Notice here there's a progression. Iniquity is spiritual. And we're going to see that sin seems to affect your soul in some way. Go to Isaiah 1. All famous verses, Isaiah 1 verse 18. And I could cite them this morning, but I want to read them, make sure I quote them exactly. So we can see here, because it is Sunday school after all. Isaiah 1 verse 18. The Lord often tells people, come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Okay. And it looks like sin has a color and it happens to be red. Okay. But the idea is the Lord, he wants to reason with you and work with you so that he can change your sin situation and become white. Okay? He wants to cleanse your soul, as many of us know. So sin affects and stains your soul. It affects what, the character you manifest in your life and what you value. Okay? And so you can place sin in the soulish or psychological realm, if you will. Okay? And there are three deadly sins in particular that kind of manifest through this. The first being greed, which is just the excessive collection of anything. Okay, well many of us think money, but really anything in general. Wanting something more than you should. Okay. Not caring about the cost that may result from you trying to obtain this item uh, uh, excessively. For example, there's a very famous uh, Roman leader who accumulated, and we'll talk about him when we get in the series, he accumulated land in a greedy manner. And he was willing to pillage and destroy people and put them in a situation where they had to pay him to fix their 
uh, fix up their uh, town or city. Okay. That's greed. Greed will drive people to do these things. Okay. And then there's envy. Yeah, it seems like when I stand like this, I got something going on there. But envy, envy is the next one. That's when you seem to desire something that is not yours. It's one thing to value things that are there that are yours, and you actually want to protect them. Like I have, I have jealousy towards my wife and my children. Just like the Lord, He's a jealous God. He wanted to protect His chosen people. It's another to desire things that aren't yours, and you're willing to do something as a result to obtain that. Okay. And then there's wrath, and this one's interesting because God has wrath. So what's the difference between God's wrath and the wrath of man, which bringeth a snare? Okay. Usually in this case, it's wrath that's attached to what happens to you and not necessarily what happens to others. A Christian could have righteous anger when he thinks about the abortions that occurs in this world, okay. and especially in this country, and how much that's affected society at large. Okay. It's different when you are out there serving Christ and you get attacked for it, and then you start feeling anger or wrath towards that person. Uh, should you? Is it right in that situation? You'd have to judge it yourself. Okay. But usually this kind of wrath is going to result in fighting. It's going to result in contention. It's going to result in you, Christian, not being meek in response to what's happening to you. You're going to want to take the defensive or even attack. Okay. And there are moments where that would be right and there are moments where it wouldn't. And the Lord's going to have to guide you on that. Okay. But oftentimes when we think of that deadly sin of wrath, we think of something that's very, very excessive. Destroying someone to the uttermost. Not just going after somebody specifically for what they did to them, but going after their family and their loved ones as well. As if you have the right to do that. Okay. And then last but not least is transgression, like we saw up there with the definition of sin. Go to Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 and verse 12, another famous verse, talking about Jesus. Therefore will I divide him as a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. And in this case, the Lord Jesus Christ, he was numbered with two other malefactors that were next to him when he was on the cross of Calvary. They were transgressors because they committed specific sins. Okay? In one, I believe in one case he was a thief. I have to check that. But they're malefactors. They had committed sin. They transgressed against the law of God. And the Lord was counted with them even though he never transgressed at all. Okay? So you can tie transgression to physical sin. Things you manifest and practice through. Okay? It will be because of your pride and your lust that you're going to want to be greedy. Or you're going to want to be envious. Or you're going to want to be wrathful towards another. Leading you to commit these transgressions. You see the build up there. Okay? And one of the big ones is sloth. Sloth. Being slothful. A.K.A. being lazy. Now, this is one I suffer from, and most people wouldn't believe me, but I'm always trying to find a way to not do what I need to be doing. Okay, and I'll thank God he's on my case. But many people actually take that to the extreme. Okay, they end up wanting things without having to work at all. Okay, like communists. Great example of people who are full of sloth. Okay, their ideas we're going to take from those that work, and we're not going to give back at all. That's the whole basis of communism. That was the whole goal of Karl Marx, is he was a lazy guy. He didn't know anything about his life. Okay? I mean, his wife had to pay the bills. We'll, get, we'll talk about him, too, in this series. We'll get to him. Okay? Or the idea that you deserve something. You have, you're entitled to receive something you didn't work for. That sounds a lot like America, doesn't it? America is full of people that transgress by, by relishing in their slothfulness. Okay. So welfare is technically a system that's driven by sloth. 
And for those who've been around during the period when Johnson introduced the whole, you know, Great Society and all that, you guys know better than me. You lived it. And you've seen the results. I walked into this and thought it was right for a little while until I got saved. Okay. They might say, well, there's some good things in the Great Society. Yeah, there's a little bit. A lot of bad, though. And usually the bad is what dominates over time. Look at right now in 2021. People in my generation think they deserve to get money from the government because they have a bunch of kids out of wedlock. Yeah. And baby daddy's taking advantage of that, which is why they're, they act the way they do. It's very disgusting. Yeah. And last but not least is gluttony. Gluttony. It's when you consume something excessively without end. So greed might motivate you to get this thing, but gluttony is when you start consuming it and practicing and using it up. Okay? And you're never satisfied if you're gluttonous. So it doesn't have to be over food, even though that's the picture most of us get. Okay? You can be gluttonous over fame or fortune or your ambitions. Okay? I need you to be willing to do whatever it takes. You're a pragmatist at heart. God is not a pragmatist, by the way. Much to the chagrin of most evangelical Christianity, God is not like that. He wants people who are faithful to what he says and how he wants things done. And they're the ones that are going to get credit in the judgment seat of Christ. I'm getting ahead of myself now. Okay. And oftentimes, if you're gluttonous, you are not temperate in all things. You don't have moderation in your life. Okay. And this was shown very much with many of the wicked kings that you find throughout history and even in the scriptures. They were gluttonous to the uttermost and took advantage of their position and try to uh, satisfy or satiate their, their uh, desires, and it never happened. Okay. And so those are the seven sins and how they fit with regards to the perspective of the different types of sin that exist. I might say, well, how does sin occur in the first place? How do we even get to this point? Well, James has an equation for us. Go to James 1. James chapter 1. James chapter 1 and verse 14, at least in the Holy Scriptures in English, the King James Bible, you can see this equation here. Okay. Might be a little obfuscated in some other Bible. But in James 1 and verse 14, the Bible says, But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own, notice the pride there, lust. There's lust and enticed. So that's why everything starts with iniquity. It's, some, it's your lust. It's not something God gave you as a desire to do. It's something that you wanted to do. And if you wanted it, it's not based on God. It's based on self. And then, verse 15, Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. That's why I have sin as a different category now. See that? So it starts out in your mind and your heart and all these things. You're ruminating, making a decision if you're going to do things the way God wants you to or the way you want to. And then you make that decision now, okay, because of the temptation. Now you've decided, I'm going to start practicing this thing. And then that's when it becomes sin and affects you psychologically. You see, the Lord, he was tempted, but he never sinned. He never went that far. Okay? That may have came his way, but he never decided to start ruminating and making a decision to go after that thing. Now, for those who are wondering how you deal with Hebrews 4, that's, that's one way to explain that. Okay? But anyways. Okay. And then, now that that sin is brought forth and it stains your soul, it's going to affect your character and manifest out on your body. And for that reason, the end of verse 15, when it is finished, because now you've practiced it and you've committed it, it bringeth forth death. For the wages of sin is death, the Bible says. That's why we die. Now you know. Sin has killed 100% of people. Sin has killed more people than COVID. Okay. This is true. In fact, COVID is just the result of it, if you think about it, Christian. So why are we worried so much about that? Man, that's another message, right? Getting back to the teaching here, okay? The reality is sin occurs because we decide to focus on ourselves more than what God has given, following that first person who sinned. So let's talk about it. Who is he? When did he do it? And where did he do it? 
These are very good questions. Okay? So now I'm going to give you something that apparently isn't the standard answer, but it should be. Go to John 8, verse 44. John 8. Mandy, why aren't you going to Genesis 3? Yeah, good question. Okay, John 8. No matter where you stand on the gap, whether you believe it or not, this should still be the right answer for you. Okay? John 8, verse 44. God manifests in the flesh, says, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and I bow down the truth. See? So who was the first one to commit these types of things and omit his desire to follow God? It was the devil himself. You can see it all in there. He's the one that comes up with these lusts. He focused on himself, and because of that, he was a murderer from the beginning. Him. I understand that, yes, from Adam, sin entered into the world. That's true. But the devil sinned before him, no matter what you think about the gap. You don't need the gap, okay? It could be a few days or a couple thousand years or some of those weirdos are thinking billions. I don't agree with them, by the way. Okay, and well, that's what I get for standing that way. Yeah. <laughs> Seems like when I do this, doesn't it? It's when we get interference. Move the mic that way. The whole thing. Like this? Let's see. Yeah, it seems to help. Okay. Can we still hear me though? Yes. Okay. So we see that the devil, he's the first one that sinned. Now you can understand why he's the enemy of God. Why he's the accuser of everyone else. He's the one that started this mess. Okay. Now that doesn't mean that Adam didn't make a choice. Nobody's saying that. But somebody was there to influence at least Eve, and then Eve influenced Adam, and Adam made a choice. So, yeah. I think it's very important to understand that. Okay. The devil was the first one. Now, where did he do this? Go to Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14. We'll look at where and when. So when it seems to have happened from the beginning. And that's a whole study there. Well, what's that about? What's the beginning? Well, it's, depends on how serious you take prepositions. I'll leave it there. Okay? I'll just leave it right there. Isaiah 14 and verse 12. God says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast set in thine heart iniquity. Notice that. I will ascend into heaven. See, he had a pride, man. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation. Why does the word sin and the word pride have the word I in the middle? That might be God's design to help us see with our sin that we focus on ourselves and not God. Sin. See that? Okay. I'm continuing here. I will sit also upon the mount of of the congregation in the sides of the north, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. And here, uh, Lucifer, who happens to be the devil, and this was his name before he fell, okay, he had five desires that were prideful and resulted in him acting. See? And if you keep reading, you'll find out what's going to happen to him. Okay. Go to Ezekiel 28 now. Go to Ezekiel 28. He, he just wanted to be like God. He didn't even want to be greater. He just wanted to be like Him. Okay. Now maybe that shows the intelligence of the devil because he seemed to realize that nobody's going to be greater than the greatest conceivable being. That's what God is, right? And that's who He is. So he's like, I'll just be equal to Him. But even then, that's more than enough to be full of pride. Despite Him being... Probably the most powerful creature to exist. Okay. Ezekiel 28 and verse uh, 13. And here we're talking about an individual. It's the king of Tyrus. But when you keep reading, you notice that it looks like the Lord is not just speaking to that king, that physical king, but also the spirit that's influencing him in the background, so to speak. Because in verse 13, talking about this king, it says, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. You're like, how could the king of Tyre have been in the garden of Eden? That's a good question. Okay. 
Now, there's a way to look at this historically in the sense that Eden is the name of a location that could be attributed to a spot geographically that's near Tyre, okay? but it doesn't completely fit. Okay? The Garden of Eden 100% fits. Okay? There was a garden planted eastward in a place called Eden. That's where Adam and Eve were. And you keep reading about him having stones and his covering and all this. Go to verse 14. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. And now you know. This ain't talking about this human being anymore. It's talking about a cherub. And an anointed cherub. But Christ, if you will. Okay. And people have connected two and two together. And notice that Lucifer was this anointed cherub. Before he fell and became the devil. And became a dragon. Let's keep reading here. Okay. Thou art the anointed cherub that cover. Verse 15. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created. So he was a complete being. Okay. He had all his wisdom and knowledge and all this. He wasn't made imperfectly like a lot makes people imperfectly, which is one of the problems with Islam. Okay. Verse 15. Till iniquity was found in thee, I will ascend. See that? And then what did he do? Verse 16. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence. And thou hast sinned. You see that? His lust conceived and they brought forth sin. And then the result of that is death. And this is why God says, in response to the five I wills of the devil, therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God. And I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground, and I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. And if you keep reading, you'll see another I will. Okay? The Lord is so exact that he, he uses will I in the middle there to make sure it's still five of them instead of six. Okay? If you were to keep reading verse 18. Okay? And there we see the issue with the devil and why God will judge him fivefold in, in response in a just manner in accordance with his sin. Okay. And so it's the same devil who happens to be the God of this world and he's influenced in it so that will help us understand why sin continues even through to today. Go to Romans 5. Let's put it all together now. Romans 5 and verse 12. Romans 5 and verse 12 says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Okay, now what's this about? Adam. Okay, Adam sinned. And because of that, sin entered into the world. All of a sudden, the personification of sin becomes the God of this world. And he has dominion. And he's influencing things. Okay? And so we see now we have the influence of this prince and power of the air and that affecting our world system. And that brings us to 1 John 2. 1 John chapter 2. The Apostle John talking about this present evil world. And he says in 1 John 2 verse 16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And notice pride and lust seem to be the roots of all these other ones. Their iniquity. Is not of the Father, but is of the world, because it matches the Father of this world with the Lord Kesef, the devil. The one that was influencing those religious leaders when they were talking against Jesus Christ. Okay. And so we see that our sociological situation, a.k.a. what's going on in this present evil world, is because of that specific prince and power of the air and his influence on the children of disobedience. That's us. Because we fell into the marketplace of sin. And that's his market. And so he gets to decide how things go. Okay. I have here Ephesians 2 verse 2 talking about Christians. Let's just read it quickly. In Ephesians 2, verse 2, 
talking about us, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince and the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. So Christian, you're supposed to be different. When you get saved, your life should change. You should see a difference. You should have a testimony. That's what you should do. But thank God, if you really trusted in Christ, at least he fixed your spiritual situation and made your sins as white as snow. And even if nobody else can see it, at least God knows. But God wants you to be different. He wants you to be able to say like Paul that you used to walk in the course of this world, but now you're different. Now you're unique. Now you're a pilgrim and stranger because you understand in accordance with Ephesians 2 that you're currently a citizen of heaven and you're working in the role of ambassador right now to the heavenly kingdom. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. Can you really say that, Chris? Yeah. Is that the way your life looks? Or is a little bit of those in that iniquity that are still affecting a part of your being? Okay. So we see the social situation here. Let's look at the individual situation. Romans 7. Romans chapter 7. So what happened? Why are we going to Romans 7, man? Isn't that about a Christian? Well, it is. All about lost people. People argue about it being about one or the other. Maybe it's about both. Why can't that be the answer? But Romans 7, verse 9. Just take a look here. Yeah. Paul expressing his situation. He tells you that he was alive without the law once. Okay. He was alive. Well, how does that work? Okay. Well, sin is not imputed where there is no law. Okay. He had a point of innocence. But then when the commandment came, sin revived and he died. Now, he didn't die physically, otherwise he wouldn't have wrote this down. He's talking about spiritual death. Okay? And this is a situation, okay? The standard teaching is that we're all born in sin, but then we all choose to sin. Just focus on the second one for this morning. And that's what he's talking about right there. Okay? Continuing on, verse 10. And the commandment which was ordained to life... is. The law doesn't kill you, okay? It's holy, it's good. Okay. I found to be unto death. Why? For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. And notice he's talking about sin like it's a person. Does that make more sense now? Now, I, I, I know we talk about, you know, well, you know, some of these things, there are personifications to give a nice spiritual teaching. But the Bible's a little more, a uh, little more different than that. Okay, if anybody who's read their Bible, they understand that the Spirit of God works and gives a hundred percent eternal truth, even through spiritual things. Yeah. who's the one influence in this world and bringing the deception? Keep that in mind. Let's keep reading. Wherefore the law is holy. Why? Because it comes from the holy God, and the commandment holy and just and good. That's why if you know to do good and you do it not, it's sin. Okay? That's why if you have doubts on something that's not in the law and it's not of faith, it's sin. Okay? Because it comes from the God of faith, the God of law, the God of truth who's holy. And so, Paul, to make sure you didn't get the wrong idea, verse 13, was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. That's not what happened. Okay? But sin, that it might appear sin, Working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. Now, now well, what is this about? Okay. Yea, hath God said that you can't eat from the trees of the garden? Thou shalt not surely die, the devil said to Eve. And notice he took the word of God, which was good, and used it against Eve to tempt her. And you know what? The devil does that with all of us. And the idea is the devil doesn't necessarily want you to follow him. He just wants you to start thinking for yourself and doing what you want. And once that pride builds up, then your lust entice you, and then you conceive and bring forth sin, and then you die. And that's what happened. It had nothing to do with God's law. God's law was right. All you had to do was follow it. You see? Instead of focusing on yourself, focus on God and do His desire. No, you chose to do something else. Okay. 
So and even if the devil, with all his influence, he was there to influence you, it doesn't mean it was his fault either. It was ultimately your fault. That's why I can't repent to God for the devil making me sin. That'll never get me saved. Isn't that right? Yeah. But there are some people who've thought of it that way for certain doctrines that some people teach. Yeah. And they kind of got a, a point, even though most of us stress the reality that it's your choice. And that's the key thing. We're the ones. We need to be saved from ourselves is what we tell people. Okay. God doesn't save us from hell. He saves us from us making ourselves go to hell. It's a very different thing. Yeah. We're the problem. And so we see the spiritual situation of the individual today. And if you were to keep reading, you'd read that you were sold under sin. You're in the marketplace of sin. And that's, that section there is where people wonder, well, is that about a saved or lost person? Maybe it's both. Okay? It depends on how you look at that. Yeah. Anyways, go to Romans 8 now. Romans 8. So we see the sociological situation of the world almost fits with the sin situation. Sin enters into the world, right? And then we see the spiritual situation of the individual where the devil tries to influence us to follow our pride and our own lust. Well, what's going on with the actual physical creation? Romans 8, verse 20. Romans 8, verse 20. Look at this now. The consequence of what Adam did and how it affected the actual creation. Because the part that was cursed, if you read it carefully, was the ground. Not his soul, necessarily. But in Romans 8, verse 20, For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly. Okay, So it's, it's not the cow's fault. Okay, that The cow's in the situation. It's not what happened. Okay. But by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together. Yeah. And we see now the physical situation of the creation is that it's deteriorating. It's not in the state of perfection. Okay? It's getting worse. One reason you physically die, Christian, is just the reality of mortality. Entropy. Okay? But everybody spiritually dies, for the wages of sin is death. Well, it applies at both levels. Okay? And so we see that sins literally affected all facets of our being. It's horrible. It's a problem. And it's a problem only God could fix. So what's the solution then? 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. How do we get out of this mess? For those who think that they could actually work their way to heaven. Did you notice all this here? What drives you to do those good works? Have you considered what you're doing them in, which is this body of wicked flesh that you've contaminated with your sin? Say. Many people focus on the good action and don't recognize what's going on within. What's driving them? Is it really a selfless desire to do right? Or is it something a little more sinister? I want people to look at me. Okay. There's only one person I know who always did it for the right reason 100% of his life. And that person's in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 55 where the Bible says, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin. See that? So sin is why you die. And the strength of sin is the law because God gave that holy law and he must judge in accordance with it. That's why there's a wage to sin, which is that death. See? But thanks be to that same God who gave that holy law, which giveth us the victory through who? Our Lord Jesus Christ. Flesh is not inherently wicked because he was manifest in flesh. But we stain ours and it affects us. Jesus Christ never sinned. And yet he voluntarily gave his life at Calvary's cross. In order for us to have the opportunity to be freed from all sin. And especially these seven deadly sins we're going to look at in this series. Okay. The Lord can give you the victory in each and every one. 
And so in this series, we're not just going to bore ourselves by looking at these specific sins in detail, but we're going to see also the grace of God, which abounds and goes over every single sin and show how Jesus Christ can give us victory over every single one. Because that's actually what's important. Yeah, you should be able to identify them, but more importantly, you should be able to identify and point people to the person who can free them from these things. That is, we're going to look at the opposite of sin, which is grace. And grace doth much more abound, thanks be to God. Okay. And so that's our introduction to the seven deadly sins. Let us pray and open up for questions, Amen. <laughs> Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for showing us these things about sin, Lord, and help us to recognize the reality.